Okay. So I, at the beginning, just want to thank the people who made these teachings possible, because I know a lot of people have been spending a lot of time organizing the teachings and preparing everything for us. So all the people at Pure Land Marketing and at Taipei Buddhist Center and all the other helpers who are f friends of Srivasti Abbey, and to thank all of you for making this teaching possible so that everybody else can come in and enjoy. And then to say that it's good to see so many familiar faces here and also some new faces. So some of you have heard the, the chapter one of the teaching and some of you haven't. So I just want to do a little bit of a review um, to fill in the, peop the people who haven't heard. Um, because the, the idea with this series of teachings would be that instead of having, you know, a random talk here and a random talk there, is each time that I come to uh, do one chapter out of this book. So it's a guide to uh, a bodhisattva's way of life. And in that way, you would get a complete teaching of a very precious text. So the author of this text is Shanti Deva. He's one of the great uh, 8th century Indian sages and practitioners. He was an extremely humble practitioner, and nobody knew of his great qualities because he kept them all very hidden. Okay, he wasn't like us. You know, we have one small quality and we advertise it to the world. We want everybody to know how marvelous we are. But Shantideva had many, many great qualities and he kept them very secret, very hidden. And he kept them so hidden that the people in his monastery thought that he only did three things and they gave him a nip nickname you know, the person who did three things. So what were the three things? He ate, he slept, and he went to the toilet. Okay, so that's all they thought that Shanti Deva knew. They thought, you know, he was so humble that they thought that he didn't know anything about the Dharma and was completely ignorant. So they arranged, uh, they wanted to like get him out of the monastery, but they couldn't, you know, you can't just kick somebody out of the monastery. So they wanted to make a fool out of him. So they asked him to give a big public teaching because they thought, oh, he's so foolish. He only does three things. He'll, he'll just look ridiculous and then he'll leave. But so they prepared one big, huge throne for him to sit on. Uh, and they didn't put any steps to get up to it, you know, so that they thought that'll start it out, okay? But he got there, and because he was such a highly realized practitioner with psychic powers, he put his hand on the throne, pushed the throne down, sat on it, and then it went back up again. Uh, and then he proceeded to give this teaching and he just talked extemporaneously. He just talked really from his heart, giving this teaching. So it wasn't a prearranged script, you know. He didn't have it all written out like a university professor presenting it at a conference. He just talked from his heart about how to practice. And the audience was riveted. They couldn't believe that this person who they thought was an idiot uh, could speak such powerful dharma. And when he got to chapter 9, which is the chapter about the wisdom realizing the nature of reality, uh, which is the emptiness of inherent existence, then he flew up into the sky and he vanished. But they could still hear his voice teaching the rest of the chapter. So he did leave the monastery after that, but not for the reasons that 
the uh, people wanted him to leave. <laughs> he went off to go and practice some more. And I received the transmission of this text several times. The, the first teachings I had on it were from Geshe Zopa. And then I've received it many times from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And it's uh, quite a precious text. Everything you need to know to become a Buddha is in this book. Okay. Uh, so we'll go through it and we'll learn. The first chapter, uh, what we covered in April when I was here, was about the benefits of bodhicitta. So bodhicitta is, and you'll hear this word used very often as I speak, bodhicitta is the mind, a primary mind that has two intentions. One intention is to work for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay. And the other intention is to become a fully enlightened Buddha in order to work for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay. So this bodhicitta mind, okay, bodhi means awakening and citta means mind. So this awakening mind is the motivation that takes us to full enlightenment. So it's the intention that was generated by all the previous Buddhas, by all the present Buddhas, and will be generated by all the future Buddhas. Okay, you cannot become a Buddha without this uh, motivation to work for the benefit of sentient beings and thereby to improve all of our capabilities and become a Buddha ourselves. This bodhicitta mind is also the source of all happiness. So it, it's not only the mind that takes us to enlightenment, where there's definitely no more suffering, but even while we're on the path, it's the cause of our happiness, okay? And I can say uh, from my own personal experience, although I have not realized bodhicitta, but just by doing the meditations that help us to generate bodhicitta, just by doing that, uh, I can say that I've seen a huge change in my mind. Uh, when I was younger, I used to have a lot of problem with depression. I used to say, what's the meaning of life? There's no meaning to life. All you do is, you know, get a job and make a lot of money and get married and have kids and die and there's no meaning to life. And uh, I felt very discouraged and uh, depressed about this. And the bodhicitta completely turned that around because it gives you a very, very strong meaning and purpose to your life, okay? Because your life no longer is about you know, just making money and having friends and having a good time. But now your life has some really special purpose because you're, you're training to be able to benefit all living beings and not just benefit all living beings by giving them food or clothing or things like that, but benefiting them by leading to them to full enlightenment where they're never going to have any suffering whatsoever ever again. Okay, so bodhicitta doesn't just take us to, you know, feeling good and happy right now, but it takes us to a state of actual security, you know, where we're never going to experience misery again. Yeah. And people are always looking for security. You know, we're trying so hard to be secure. You know, you need your savings fund and you need your, what's the housing fund in Singapore that you have? I forget the name, it has three letters. What? C C CPF? Okay, that one, okay. So you think that, you know, you just have to get your CPF, then you have real security, right? Okay, and you have your bank account, your stock, and you build them up. Then you have real security, huh? Yeah. Does, does that bring you real security? 
even if you have hundreds and millions of zillions of dollars, do you, feel, do you ever feel secure? 100% secure? No. Okay? Uh, because the very nature of cyclic existence, the state that we live in, is the nature of it is insecurity because everything's changing all the time. Yeah, no matter how much money you have, there's always inflation, and then it's not worth as much as it was when you got it, okay? And no matter how many insurance policies you have, they can't prevent you from getting sick because the very nature of having this kind of body is that it gets old and sick and dies. Okay, so we run around trying to make ourselves secure, but we never reach real security. Okay, and every time we have a problem, we go into crisis. You know, we have the initial problem, and then we go, ah, I have a problem. What am I going to do? Oh. You know, and we get so upset, and then we talk to our friends, and we tell our friends our problem on and on and on and on and on and on and on. You know, and our friend is going, oh my God, this is so boring. I love this person, but they tell me their problem every time I see them. But for us, our problem is so interesting, isn't it? We could talk about our problem over and over and over again because we think our problem is the worst problem in the entire universe. Yeah. Why? Because it's my problem. Yeah. And that makes it the worst thing. Why? Because I'm the center of the universe. You know, and everything should be the way I want it to be. And if it's not, well, something's really wrong. Okay. So we get all bent out of shape because everything doesn't happen the way we want it. And then we compound our problem by feeling sorry for ourselves. Okay. Some of you may know that I do work with uh, prison inmates in the U.S. I write to them, I go in and, and teach Buddhism in prison. And one of the inmates coined the phrase, a pity party, okay? You know self-pity, yeah? So we throw ourselves a pity party where we just feel sorry for ourselves. okay? So we're, we're the chief, uh, we're the guest of honor at the party. Okay, and it revolves completely around us, and everybody's supposed to feel sorry for us. And of course, all of our friends get bored, which shows how stupid they are, uh, you know, because our problem is so interesting. So we just throw our pity party alone and feel sorry for ourselves and go around and around and around saying, poor me, poor me, poor me, poor me. Okay, that's our mantra. Yeah. <laughs> Omani Pei Hung goes out the window, and instead we, we take out our prayer beads, poor me, poor me, poor me, poor me. <laughs> Don't we? <laughs> yeah. And we, we have our little pity party. We do our mantra. And nothing changes, does it? Well, actually, something changes. We usually feel worse. Yeah, because whenever we feel sorry for ourselves, we make our misery more intense because first there was the initial problem, and then we have the problem of getting depressed about the problem. And then we have the problem of getting angry because we've gotten depressed about the problem. Okay, and then we get discouraged because we've gotten angry, because we've gotten depressed about the problem. Okay, so do you see what's going on? Everything is just circling around me. Okay, it's all about me. 
I got a request from, uh, uh, you know, I get these emails sometimes of people wanting to reprint material that I've written. So a couple of uh, months ago, I got a request from a magazine. The name of the magazine is Me, okay? And their purpose is to teach you that it's all about you. Because, <laughs> you know, before I gave them my permission, I have to look and see what the magazine about. So that's their byline, you know? It's all about you. It's all about me. And that's their purpose. And I wrote them a letter and I said, you can use my material, but I really disagree with what you're saying. <laughs> because in my whole life, my training as a Buddhist is to overcome the thought that it's all about me. Because that thought that it's all about me leads us to so much suffering and so much misery. And yet, this is what our 21st century society is teaching us. Yeah? And this is what the advertising industry is really encouraging us to believe, because you sell more things if you tell everybody it's all about me. I mean, even on the ride here, it was only, I don't know, 10, 15 minute ride to get here. I saw a bus, an, an SPB bus on the side. You know, it, it was saying, it was encouraging people to speak better English. Yeah, have you seen that bus? Yeah, and uh, what do they have written on the side of it? This is mine. Yeah, that's one of the first things we learn to say when we're two years old, isn't it? All of those who, who, of you who are parents who have had two-year-old kids, what's the first thing that a two-year-old learns? You know, they learn mommy and daddy, and then they learn mine. <laughs> Okay, and so here it is, right on the side of the bus, teaching us, this is mine, okay? And we get this message again and again and again that it's all about me because the advertising industry thinks that it's gonna sell more stuff if it convinces us that it's all about us. So therefore, we can buy everything we want. We can consume everything we want. We can have everything we want. So we get this mentality, you know, of the whole world should revolve around me. And the more we think like that, the more miserable we are, okay? You'd think that the more we thought about ourselves and tried to be happy, the happier we'd be, we would be, but actually it's just the opposite, okay? The more we're focused on ourselves, the more miserable we are. Why? Because we become so super sensitive about every teeny weeny thing that has to do with me, okay? Everything that has to do with me becomes blown up out of proportion, and so we become miserable, yeah? We, we go into work, and somebody doesn't say hello in the morning. Oh, we're so offended. My colleague didn't say hello. I don't know what's wrong. You know, something must be very wrong with him that he didn't say hello. Or maybe something's wrong with me. Oh no, maybe something's wrong with me. Oh, I don't know. And then we get all worried. You know, maybe our colleague didn't feel well and that's why they didn't say good morning. Or maybe they were, were in the middle of finishing something and they didn't say good morning. But we make it into this whole big personal trip you know, and then we worry about the relationship. So you see how thinking about ourself makes us miserable? When, we, when that self-centered attitude is so strong, we invent problems that aren't even there. Okay, we completely create problems. We get, why are we nervous? You know how we get nervous sometimes? You go in a room where you don't need people or you need to give a presentation, you know, speak in front of a group of people or you need to do, 
do, do something and you get really nervous, what's at the root of being nervous? Why are we nervous? Yeah. Why are we nervous? Because we're afraid that we'll make a mistake and look like an idiot, isn't it? You know, it's completely, we're totally self-focused. We don't care about the other people. We just care about me. I don't want to look bad. Yeah. You know, I heard about a study that some psychologists did, and when they tabulated the results, more people were afraid of speaking in front of a group than they were afraid of dying. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, more people are afraid of speaking in front of a group. Why? Because they might look like an idiot. They're more afraid of looking like an idiot than they are of dying. Huh? Something's wrong. <laughs> okay? But, you know, all this incredible self-consciousness we have, lack of self-esteem, being too shy, being so angry, it all comes because we're just spinning around ourselves, thinking, I'm so important, everything should happen the way I want it to. Okay. So if we really look in our life, we see that the self-centered mind is the root of our suffering. Now, why is bodhicitta so beneficial? Because it's the thing that counteracts the self-centered mind. It's the total opposite of our self-preoccupied mind. Because with bodhicitta, that aspiration for enlightenment, for the benefit of all beings, we're completely focused on what is beneficial for all sentient beings. Of course, it includes ourself, but we're only one sentient being. We're not the center of the universe, okay? So by focusing our attention and on taking care of others, by having compassion for others, actually, we feel happier ourselves. Yeah, when we stop trying so hard to make things the way we want them to be, then we start accepting things how they are. We become much more content. We become much happier. Of course, we still try and improve society, but we're not doing it for our own benefit. We're doing it for the benefit of all beings. Okay. So our mind is happier because our, we have a much larger perspective and we're working for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay. We are, we're also happier when we generate bodhicitta because our heart is full of love for others. Whenever we see any other person, our instant reaction is, there's somebody who's lovable. There's somebody who's been kind to me. Okay. That's very different than how we look at people now when we're really self-centered, isn't it? What's our first thought now when we see somebody? Do they like me? Isn't that one of our first thoughts when we meet somebody? Do they like me? Am I safe around them? Are they going to be nice to me? Am I going to like them? Are they going to give me what I want? Am I going to talk, uh, talk them into thinking that I'm a good person? This is what our first thought is, OK? And we can see how that thought just breeds so much insecurity, so much uh, lack of self-confidence. But when we drop that self-centered thought and instead turn our attitude to benefiting others, then our heart is so open and so joyful because when any, whenever we see anybody, 
our thought is, here's a person who's kind. Here's a person who's lovable. And so instead of worrying about what they think of me, and if I'm good enough, our focus is on how can I help this person? How can I lead them to enlightenment? How can I make their life easier? How can I make them happier? Okay, so our attention is totally focused on bringing long-term benefit to others. When our mind has that kind of intention, our mind is relaxed and it's peaceful and it's joyful. Okay, and we're not filled with self-doubt and self-confidence. Okay, in addition, when we have this bodhicitta mind that cherishes others, we have a very strong ability to go th through difficulties. We don't get discouraged. We don't get depressed. Okay, we don't get overburdened when there's a problem and collapse because we're so distraught and we're so fearful. Okay, bodhicitta makes the mind incredibly strong, incredibly strong. Yeah, so that you're not afraid of the future and you're not afraid of anybody because your, your heart is so filled with love and compassion that there's no room for fear. Yeah, think about it. When you really care about others, is there room for fear in your mind? Yeah, when you're genuinely focused with compassion on the welfare of others, there, there's no, you automatically don't feel afraid, okay? Because your whole focus in, in life is different, okay? So it gives you the ability to go through all sorts of problems, okay? You look at His Holiness the Dalai Lama, okay? Now, we all have problems in our life, don't we? Yeah, and we moan and groan about our, about our problems. But are we a refugee? No, okay. You look at the Dalai Lama, he became a refugee when he was 24 years old, okay. He had to assume uh, responsibility to lead his people when he was 15 years old. Now think back to when you were 15. Were you ready to be prime minister? I wasn't. Okay. Now you look at his life. He had to assume the responsibilities of something comparable to a prime minister when he was 15. When he was 24, he had to flee out of his country because the communists were trying to kill him. Okay, he hasn't been to, able to return to his country. And in the meantime, there's been genocide. Yeah, they've dumped nuclear waste and all kinds of toxic materials in the open spaces of Tibet. You know, and we think we have problems. Yeah, our problems are really kind of insignificant sometimes when we compare uh, to the problems of other people and what they've gone through in their lives, you know? We've kind of, Singapore is such a peaceful country. People have enough to eat. You have very good social policies here. So there's not many people I, or any people living on the street. But still, we manage to invent problems, don't we? Okay. When you have bodhicitta, then your mind doesn't invent problems because the mind is focused with love and compassion on caring about others. And so there's an incredible sense of contentment and peace within our own hearts. And then even if we have problems, like you see even the Dalai Lama became a refugee, when you see him, is he walking around like this? Oh, I'm a refugee. I haven't been able to go back to my country. 
Um, you know, he's not walking around like that. He's happy and he's joyful and he's not all angry about it. Well, that's by the power of great compassion and bodhicitta. Okay? So, the first chapter in this book talked about bodhicitta to really get us to see the benefits of cultivating love and compassion for all beings. And we do that by remembering the kindness of others, how people have been kind to us. Okay? And we can see the kindness of our family very easily, but to train our mind to see the kindness also of strangers, okay, of people that we don't know. So think today of how many people we have benefited from who we don't even know. Okay, just for example, we're sitting in Taipei Buddhist Center right now. Okay, this was this center was founded by Venerable Fat Kwan and her long-term vision. She was an incredible Singaporean nun who I was privileged to meet, and I actually stayed at her temple. Um, you know, when I first came to Singapore in 1987. But she had a vision to build this. And so many people gave donations to build this center that we're sitting in right now. Okay. Do we know the, peop the people who built this? Do we know all the donors who supported her vision to build this center? Do we know the, pe the construction workers, or the architect, or the engineer, or the plumber, or the electrician? Okay. I don't think we know many of those people, do we? And yet, we're enjoying the fruits of all their labors, because we just come in here this evening, and here's this beautiful temple where we can sit down in a peaceful environment, yeah, they, they made it especially with a good acoustic system so you can hear the teaching without any echoes. Yeah, and we benefited from so many people's thoughtfulness and so many people's mind, you know, care about us to build this place so that we could come and listen to teachings and create merit. And we don't even know those people, and yet look how much we've benefited from what they've done. Okay? You think about it, it's really Im um, incredible. Yeah? Think about all the food you ate today. Do you know the people who, eat, who grew the rice that you ate? Yeah? They, I don't think, do you grow any rice in Singapore? I don't think so. It's all imported, isn't it? So here's all these people from other countries who grew the food that you ate today. Do you know any of them? You know, people who worked in the, in the rice paddies? It's not easy working in a rice paddy. Yeah, it's hot, your back hurts. Yeah, the people who planted the rice, who harvested it, who prepared it. Yeah, I mean, just the food we eat, we don't even know where it came from anymore. And all the people involved in uh, making it. Instead, we just have food and we think, oh, good, this is for me. But wait a minute, you know, it came due to the kindness of so, so many people who grew it. And these people are total strangers. And we wouldn't be alive if it weren't for their kindness and their effort. Yeah. So when we look like this and we see how many people are involved with just our staying in alive, then we have a tremendous sense of gratitude for the kindness that we've experienced in our life. Okay. And when we see others as kind, then automatically they appear as lovable and beautiful to us. And when they appear as lovable, we're not afraid of them anymore. OK? 
Okay. So I mentioned the prison work that I do in the U.S. I've also uh, been to uh, um, a prison in Singapore a couple of times, and I'll be going again on this visit. And sometimes people say to me, aren't you afraid to go into prisons? You know? And I go, no, why should I be afraid? You know, other people, oh, oh, oh. Prisoners, oh, you know, and especially in the U.S. because uh, we have much more crime in the U.S. than you have in Singapore. Your government, I think, is much wiser here, and they don't allow any of the citizens to have guns. In America, people can have guns, and it's the cause of a lot of problems. But the government doesn't want to change it. Anyway. Um, I'm not afraid when I go into, into prisons. And people are, why not? Why not? You know, well, because when I go in, those people are teaching me something, and I'm very grateful to them. And I have learned so much from the inmates that I would never, ever have learned if I had not met them, because how can I even explain it, what, what they teach me? The, they're people who can be very honest, okay? At least the people who write to me, they're very honest. They're, they're really seeking the Dharma. They actually want to practice. And what is very wonderful about them is they are ready to admit their faults. Okay. Most of us who are not inmates, we cover up our faults, don't we? Yeah. We make mistakes and we go, it wasn't me, it was him. <laughs> yeah? In our workplace, isn't it? We make a mistake and, oh, no, it's not my fault. It's because so-and-so did that and so-and-so did this. You know, we're always kind of covering up for ourselves. The inmates that I work with, they're willing to look and be honest with themselves. And that's a quality I really appreciate. Okay? And so when I'm with them, I'm not afraid of them because they're will they have that quality of being honest about the mistakes that they made. Okay? And they give me an opportunity to overcome my fear, because some of the people I work with have done the things that I am most afraid of, okay? And yet, being a Buddhist and being a nun and having taken the bodhisattva vows, you know, when you take the bodhisattva vows, then you're committed to helping sentient beings. You can't just tune people out because they've done things that you're afraid of. Okay. But they, in getting to know them, they've really showed me how to overcome my fear of people and how to be very broad-minded and to learn that people make mistakes, but it doesn't mean that they're evil people. Yeah. And to learn that if I can forgive them, for the mistakes that they've made, then also I can forgive myself for the mistakes I've made. And learning how to forgive ourselves is something very, very important to have a peaceful heart. Okay. So they've taught me all, this, all these kinds of things. So I can see them as lovable in that way and appreciate them as being kind. So what I'm getting at, okay, is when we subdue our self-centered mind and, and turn our focus on others, we can see that we've benefited from everybody. We've benefited from the strangers who feed us and who give us shelter, who make our clothes. We even benefit from people who have harmed us 
or people who have done very negative actions because they teach us things that we could never have learned otherwise. Okay? And even in your own life, Okay, we've all had people who have harmed us, right? But haven't we learned something very important from the harm that we've received? Yeah? Think about it. Would you be the same person now if you had not received the harm that you had received throughout your life? Okay. So, this is the essence of chapter one in the book, okay? Seeing the benefits of bodhicitta. Now we're going to get into the actual teaching that we're doing uh, in, you know, in these four days, which is on chapter two. So let's look at the text. Okay, so chapter two is called The Disclosure of Wrongdoing. Okay, let's, let me give just a little introduction to this chapter. Um, this, before we can generate this loving, compassionate attitude of bodhicitta, we have to learn to, we, we have to do two things. We have to purify our negative karma, and we have to create a great deal of merit or positive potential, okay? So this chapter, The Disclosure of Wrongdoing, is really focused on that, on helping us to disclose the mistakes that we've made, just like the prisoners that I was talking about, you know, it's teaching us to be very, very honest. Yeah. So it's helping us to purify, and it's also, this chapter is going to teach us how to create merit. So remember, Shanti Deva, as he's writing this, it's written in the first person. So he's just telling us what he thinks and how he practices. And, you know, sometimes in our mind we think, well, what does a bodhisattva think anyway? What are their minds like anyway? Well, when we read this text, he's telling us, okay, we're getting a first-person view of what it's like. So he starts out, and he says, in order to adopt that jewel of the mind, I make offerings to the Tathagatas, to the stainless jewel of the sublime Dharma, and to the children of the Buddhas who are oceans of excellent qualities. Okay? So when he says, in order to adopt that jewel of the mind, the jewel of the mind refers to the bodhicitta. Okay? So in order to adopt it, then we have to create positive potential or merit. So we do that by making offerings. So he makes offerings to the Tathagatas, in other words, to the Buddhas, to the stainless jewel of the sublime Dharma, and to the children of the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, who are the oceans of excellent qualities. So let's pause for a minute here and talk about the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, because what are they? Yeah, if we're Buddhists, or even if we're thinking of Buddhism, you know, we should know what the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are. They're called the three jewels, and we take refuge in them. We go to them for our spiritual guidance. So the Dharma is the real refuge, yeah, because the Dharma refers to the path to liberation and all the cessations of suffering and the cessations of the causes of suffering. Okay, that's what the, the jewel of the Dharma refers to. So when we actualize the Dharma in our own heart, that is the real protection. That is actual security. 
okay? Because when we've actualized the path to enlightenment in our heart, when we've ceased all suffering and the causes of suffering, then we have actual security, we have actual happiness and joy, okay? So that dharma, when we actualize it in our own heart, is our real refuge. The Buddha, which is called here the Tathagata, the one gone to, to the Tathagata, the, the translation is the, uh, the one gone to thusness, or the one thus gone. It means the one who perceives the nature of reality. Okay? So the Buddha is the one who taught the Dharma. Okay? The Buddha did not invent the Dharma. Okay? The Buddha did not create us. The Buddha did not create the path to enlightenment. But the Buddha learned how things operate, what are the causes of suffering, what are the causes of happiness. He created all the causes of happiness in his own mind. And then, as a fully enlightened being, his whole purpose was out of compassion to teach us how to create the causes of suffering and abandon the causes of misery, okay? So the Buddha is the one who taught the Dharma, and he's, he taught it out of his own experience, okay? So everything that we learn about in the Buddha's teachings is something that somebody has experienced. It's not abstract philosophy. Okay, but it's actually enlightened beings telling us what it's like to be an enlightened being from their own experience. So we can really trust the Dharma, the teachings that the Buddha has taught because they're coming up from experience. And then the Buddha not only taught them, okay, but his disciples actualized those teachings. And so for 2,500 years, because the Buddha lived in the 6th century BC, for 2,500 years, there's been realized practitioners who have actualized the Dharma that the Buddha taught. Those realized practitioners and the ones who have generated the aspiration for enlightenment, the ones who have generated the bodhicitta, those are called bodhisattvas, okay? And so when it talks about the children of the Buddha or the children of the conqueror, it's referring to those bodhisattvas. And the bodhisattvas have such intense love and compassion for us that if they could give up their own enlightenment and stay in the cycle of existence that we're stuck in, if it would be beneficial for them to give up their own enlightenment and do that, they would be happy to do that. That's how much love and compassion they have for the rest of us sentient beings, okay? Bodhisattvas, in fact, don't give up their enlightenment and stay in cyclic existence because they see that they can be of greater benefit to others when they become fully enlightened Buddhas. So Kuan Yin, for example, yeah, has actually gone on to become a Buddha and so has Manjushri and Samantabhadra. Okay, they've all become Buddhas, but they appear in that form of a bodhisattva demonstrating that incredible compassion that says, I'm willing to even give up my own enlightenment if that would be of greater benefit to others. Okay, now they see that it's actually of greater benefit to others if they become Buddhas, so they complete the path because then they have more abilities to help us. Okay, but they're, they're so astounding because they're willing to, to give up any kind of self-happiness, whether it's worldly or spiritual, by the power of their compassion, okay? And so in this verse, it's saying that we make offerings to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the Bodhisattvas, okay? And, what, and why do we make offerings, okay? 
if you're a Buddha, do you need somebody to offer you flowers? Okay. You know, now, if you're a, a woman who wants to, to make sure that your boyfriend loves you, or if your guy wanting to show your girlfriend that you love her, you get her flowers. Okay. Our ego needs to get flowers, doesn't it? And our ego needs to give flowers. But when we're offering to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, okay, does the Buddha need flowers? Does the Buddha need oranges and apples to be happy? Okay. Does the Buddha need incense or lights? I mean, if you're a fully enlightened being, you are in a realm of bliss that, you know, forget about apples and oranges, you know. They're not doing much for you. Even chocolate, yeah. <laughs> you know. But we make offerings to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha because it's important for us to learn how to give. Yeah, one of the chief qualities of a bodhisattva that we aspire to develop is generosity. Actually, one of the chief qualities of a kind human being is generosity, isn't it? This whole world functions by, by people being generous. So we make offerings in order to increase our generosity and to train our mind to take delight in being generous. And by being generous to others, we create a lot of merit or positive potential that enriches our own mind and it makes it easier for us to gain spiritual realizations. In addition, merit or positive potential, it's good karma, so it creates the cause for us to have happiness in this life and in future lives. Okay. So today, we had food to eat. Okay. Now, we may have taken all the food we ate for granted, like, because there's food every day, isn't there? You just go to the store and you buy food. Well, we happen to be incredibly fortunate here in Singapore. There's so much food. There are places on this planet where there is no food. Okay, you go to Darfur in Africa right now. You know, there's no food. Yeah, there's no water. There are people on this planet who are starving. And we just go to the market and buy food. And we have so much access to food that we sometimes even throw it away. Isn't that incredible? You know, we just throw away food and then there's people on the same planet, yeah, who don't have enough to eat. And why is it? Okay, that we have food and other people don't. Well, in a worldly way, part of it has to do with the political system. Part of it has to do of whether there's war or whether there's peace in the country. Part of it has to do with the climate, whether there's a drought, okay? So though that there are certain causes that are going around now, but that happen now, but why are we born here instead of being born in Darfur? Okay, why? Why were we born in a place where there's food aplenty and not where there's a drought and warfare? Okay, that happened because of our good karma from previous lives. Okay. And we had food today because we were generous sharing food, sharing other things with other people in the past. So what we receive today is a product of the causes that we created in the past. So receiving things is a result of generosity, of giving. Okay? There, there's. Uh, an, a one way to express the, the law of karma is what goes around comes around. 
okay? So what you give out into the universe comes around to you. When we are generous, our own fortune increases. When we are cruel, other people become mean to us, okay? So karma is, you know, it doesn't always ripen in the lifetime we create it in, but we do experience the result of the actions that we created. And in particular here, you know, we are able to eat today because we were generous. So we made offerings to either sentient beings in the past, or maybe we made offerings to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha in the past, and as a result, we have food to eat today. Okay? So when we understand karma, and we can look at our own lives and see the fortune in the, that we have now, and know the kind of causes we created in the past to have the fortune that we have now, then that gives us a lot of inspiration to keep creating all those kinds of causes in the future. Okay? So instead of just saying, oh, I created some good karma in the past, now I'm re reaping the benefit of it, isn't this jolly? Then really using our resources, again, to share, to create more merit, because it, it enriches our mind and it makes uh, not only this life better, but future lives better, and it enables us to, to gain dharma realizations. But also, when we're generous, it creates happiness in the world. It creates beauty in the world. Like I was saying, we're here in this hall tonight due to the generosity of all the people who made donations so that it could be built. Okay? So those people were making offerings, you know, to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha to build a place where we could make more offerings and have more teachings. Okay, so what do we offer? Okay, the chapter continues. It says, as many flowers, fruits, and medicinal herbs as there are, and as many jewels as there are in the world, and clear and pleasant waters, jeweled mountains, forested regions, and other delightful and solitary places, vines shining with the ornaments of lovely flowers, and trees with branches bowed with delicious fruit. Okay, so those are just two of the verses. It's going to go on here. Okay, I wanna tell you how to listen to it as I'm, as I'm reading this and as you read along with me. When we're reading this, okay, imagine all of these things and imagine that you're offering them to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, okay? So don't read this like a textbook. We're not studying what Shanti Deva did. Oh, he did this and this and this. But actually, he's offering these things himself, and by it being written in the first person, and are saying, I offer this and I offer that, then in our own heart, in our own mind, let's imagine all these things and offer them. Okay. Now, you might say, well, what's the use of imagining all these things? Okay, shouldn't I make actual offerings? Well, yes, it is good to make actual offerings. You know, and people do offer flowers and lights and influence and, and fruit and everything, okay? They make offerings to build the building. They make offerings to bring teachers here, okay? So we do make actual offerings, but it's also important to, to imagine offerings because uh, there's a, f a few reasons for imagining offerings. One is, okay, when we imagine beautiful things, our mind feels happy, okay? When we imagine beautiful things and then we give them away to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, for whom we have the utmost love and respect, then our heart feels even happier, 
Okay, then our mind really takes delight in giving, takes delight in being generous. It creates an incredibly happy state in our own mind, okay? Because think about it, yeah? If we imagine, uh, if you imagine dirty, yucky places, yeah? then your mind feels a little bit discouraged, doesn't it? If you think of, if I say think of a dirty, filthy place with rats crawling around, you know, you go, Bleh. yeah. So that affects your mood. If I say, think of flowers and fruits and medicinal herbs and jewels, okay? and clear and pleasant waters and jeweled mountains and forests and um, flowers and trees and flowers and vines and parks and lakes and oceans and clear water and things like this. Doesn't your mind feel a lot happier just even thinking about those things? Yeah, maybe for Singaporeans, instead of talking about natural places, maybe I should say, imagine piles of money. <laughs> oh, then everybody feels so happy. Oh, now, see, all the Singaporeans, now you're very happy. Okay, piles of money, and piles, and more piles, and piles of gold, and piles of jewel, and piles of stock, and piles of bonds, okay? And more piles of money of all the currency in the world. Okay, infinite pot. And um, do you have ATM machines here? Is that what you call them? Are they called ATM machines? Okay, and you have piles of ATM machines and credit cards galore and checkbooks that are infinite in how many checks you can write and credit cards with no limit. Okay, and millions of orchard roads. The world is paved with orchard roads, and you can go in and get anything you want, and even 10 things of anything you want. Got it now? Okay, now imagine offering all of that to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Okay, and offering it with a feeling of happiness because you love the Buddha, you love the Dharma, you love the Bodhisattvas and the Arhat. You want all sentient beings to be happy, and you know that if you offer all these piles of money and jewels and orchard roads to them, that they will use it to benefit all other living beings because they have absolutely no attachment to it. Okay? So we had to rewrite Shanti Deva so that you got the idea. <laughs> but let's go back to what Shanti Deva is saying, okay? And maybe you'll you'll learn to appreciate nature a little bit too as we're reading this, <laughs> because where I live at, at Shravasti Abbey, you know, we have 240 acres of land, so I really love nature. Okay, so I, I like these verses very much. So we'll read a few more of the verses and really imagine offering them as we do. Okay, fragrances and incense, wish fulfilling trees, jeweled trees, lakes adorned with lotuses, enchanting calls of wild geese in the worlds of gods and other celestials, uncultivated crops, planted crops, and other things that ornament the venerable ones, all these that are unknown and that extend throughout space. Okay, so we're offering even things that don't belong to us, and they don't need to belong to us for us to offer them, because we're offering the beauty, okay? And it's just, it makes our minds so happy to offer beauty to think of beauty, okay? I bring to mind an offer to the foremost of sages 
together with their children. Okay, so the foremost of sages to all of the Buddhas and their children, the bodhisattvas, may those worthy of our precious gifts, the greatly merciful ones, compassionate towards me, accept these from me. So we're asking the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, please accept my offerings. You know, I've imagined these beautiful things. I'm offering them with a mind of faith. You know, please accept my offerings. And when you offer like this, you imagine the Buddha, okay? And you imagine all the bodhisattvas, okay? In fact, the whole sky is filled with holy beings, and the whole sky is filled with all the offerings, and you present it to them. And whenever you offer someone something, you are making a karmic connection with them. Okay, even we offer things to human beings. We're making a connection with them. When we offer to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, we're making a connection with them, okay? The connection with the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is the most important connection that we make in our lives, okay? Because people, human beings, they come and they go. The Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, if we have them in this life and in next life and the life after that, then they will lead us out of the misery of cyclic existence into enlightenment, okay? So making a strong connection with the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha is extremely important, okay? There's one Chinese word for connection for karmic connection, what is it? People have taught me before, but I keep forgetting it. You know, isn't there one Chinese word? People always tell me, in Taiwan especially, they talk about it. When you make a connection with somebody. Hmm? Yeah. Yuan, Yuan, that's it, that's it, Yuan, yeah that connection, okay? So you're making that karmic connection. So when we make offerings to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, we're making that very strong connection with them. That's an extremely important connection for us to make, okay? Because when we die, if we remember that connection with the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, then we can die and our mind will be completely peaceful. We'll have a good rebirth, okay? We'll be able to keep practicing in the future. So it's a very, very important connection. Okay. Actually, you know what? It's nearly nine o'clock. Why don't I, we, we finished six verses this is very good for me because I'm pretty slow, okay? <laughs> so I wanted to leave some time for questions so we can ask questions. So let, let's do that now. And, you know, we'll continue tomorrow night. Before tomorrow night, read these verses and imagine them and imagine making these offerings. Okay, now for your questions, if you want to write them down, that's fine. There are some of the ushers who will collect them, or I'm uh, not sure if there's a, is there a microphone? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's also a microphone. Uh, so either way yes, you uh, want to uh, do uh, it. Earlier this year, mm -hmm. Ajahn Brahmali and a Western Buddhist monk, a Norwegian really, gave a Dharma talk at the Buddhist Fellowship Center in Singapore, which he said, it is impossible to live a life completely virtuous. My question is, how much leeway does Buddhism give us? Suppose we are 50% virtuous. For example, our hearts is filled with love and compassion for all sentient beings. But we are also 50% non-virtuous, vices. For example, uh, alcohol abuse, smoking. Uh, Excuse me, could you just synthesize your question for me? 
and ask like a one sentence question that way it's easier for me to understand. Uh, we, we, we also dream of pounds of money, gold and, and jewelry, credit card of no limit, ATM in our homes. Can we still call ourselves Buddhists? No one is perfect they say. So an imperfect Buddhist then. I ask because every time people ask me, are you a Buddhist? I have a big problem. Am I a Buddhist? Am I an imperfect Buddhist? Or am I a <laughs> lousy Buddhist? Okay. Okay. So your question is, um, can we live a life that is completely virtuous and can we be a Buddhist without being completely virtuous? Okay. I think it's very important to remember that all Buddhists are not Buddhas. Okay, there's a difference between a Buddhist and a Buddha. Yeah. Um, in every religion, there's the holy beings and then there's the rest of us. Okay, why are we Buddhists? Because we're trying to practice what the Buddha taught. Okay, practice implies that you haven't mastered it yet. Practice implies that you do it again and again and again to improve the state of your mind, okay? So yes, we can be Buddhists, even if we are imperfect human beings, okay? In fact, only the Buddhas are perfect in the sense of having a truly virtuous, 100% virtuous motivation all the time. The rest of us, you know, we have a ways to go before our minds are completely pure. But still, we're practicing, and by transforming our minds into a virtuous state, we're benefiting ourselves and we're benefiting the entire society. Okay? Uh, when you quoted somebody as saying, we cannot live 100% virtuous lives, I think for the high-level bodhisattvas, they're doing a pretty good job of doing that. The rest of us are trying to emulate them, okay? But don't think it's impossible, yeah? Because if we think something's impossible, then we'll never get there. But if we really see that the qualities of the Buddhas are qualities we ourselves can develop, then will feel much more invigorated and will practice more to try and develop those qualities. So even though we do have negative motivations and we sometimes lose our temper, we may sometimes speak harsh words, practicing definitely improves the state of our mind and helps us and benefits others and will slowly, gradually get better. And it's completely okay to be this kind of Buddhist because that's the kind of Buddhist we are. Okay? But we're trying, and that's the important thing. Okay, other questions? Yeah? Okay, I'll, re I'll repeat the, the question. So she's saying, you know, that, that I said that we're fortunate to be here in Singapore and not be born in Darfur. And so how did that happen karmically? What, what uh, is the karmic reason for that? Okay. Okay, so the karmic reason for the people born in Darfur, okay? Now, all of us, each one of us, we have in the past committed some virtuous karma, some wholesome karma, and some unwholesome karma, okay? I mean, even this lifetime, we've done some good things, we've been kind, and we've also been mean, right? even this lifetime. So we have in our mind stream all sorts of karmic seeds. We have positive karmic seeds, we have negative karmic seeds. We even have karma that's kind of neutral, that doesn't bring either happiness or unhappiness. At 
the time of death, some of that karma ripens and throws us or propels us into our next rebirth. Okay, not all of the karma ripens at once, okay, because our mind stream is full of this incredible diversity of karmic seeds. Whatever karma ripens at the moment of death is going to be the foremost one propelling us into taking a certain rebirth, okay. The thought we have at the time of death is very important because the thought influences what kind of karma will ripen. Also, what actions we did repeatedly in our life makes certain karmas heavier and thus more likely to ripen. Okay? So, in terms of the people born in a situation where there's a lot of poverty and warfare, first of all, they're born as human beings. Being born as a human being is a result of good karma, okay? Even though they're born in a place where there's poverty and warfare, being born as a human being is the result of having kept ethical discipline in a previous life. Okay, so having refrained from harmful actions, refrained from killing and stealing and lying and so forth, getting very good ethical discipline, that is a result of their being born in a human body. Okay, so it's very similar. That's how this lifetime where we're born in a human body. Okay, if we're born in a place where there's a lot of drought, Drought is very often the result of miserliness or stinginess, okay? Because in a place where there's drought, nothing grows, okay? In a place where we refuse to, where we don't share, then, you know, people don't have. Being born in a place with drought can also be a result of wrong views when we have very stubborn, wrong views, for example, saying uh, it's impossible to become enlightened or karma and its effects don't exist. You know, in a mind that has wrong views, virtue cannot grow very easily. So that kind of gets, it, our, our environment becomes like that, a place where even, Food doesn't grow very easily. So that fact of being born in a, in a place where there's a lack of food is from negative karma, okay? The fact of being born in a place where there's warfare is, you know, maybe, yeah, well, w when we live in a place where there's violence around us, it could be a, a result of our having been violent in a previous life. Okay, so maybe having been soldiers or rebels or whatever in a previous life, maybe having beaten people up or harmed them in a previous life, then that creates being born in that kind of place right now. It's important to remember when we think like this that not any of our births are permanent. Okay, so we might be born in a place where there's peace and food right now, but that does not mean that we're always going to have such a life because we have negative karmic seeds on our mind stream that could ripen at the end of our life and next life we're born in Dafur and maybe the person who's born in Dafur is born in Singapore. Okay, because none of the lives we live are, are permanent. They're always changing. Okay, so uh, I find it actually quite interesting when you read the newspaper to see the newspaper as a teaching about karma. Yeah, because when you read the newspaper and you see the situations that people experience, we can think what kind of actions must people have created to have that kind of experience now. 
And whatever kind of action that creates that kind of experience, I want to make sure in my life that I don't do it. Because when I see people having harmful ex things happen to them, I don't want to create the cause of that. When I read the newspaper and I see people having good things happen, I want to create the cause of that. So I think about what kind of karma could have created the cause for happiness, and I want to put my energy in that direction. Okay? So we can, when we read the newspaper, we can read it like it's a teaching on karma. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful that way. It's, it's a wake-up call for us so that we don't take our good fortune for granted and that, so that we really uh, are very conscientious about trying to act in kind ways and refrain ourselves from unwholesome behavior. Okay, so the first question is, is, can one choose not to be reborn? <laughs> okay, the only way not to be reborn is to realize the nature of reality and so that we eliminate the ignorance, anger, and clinging attachment and karma that cause rebirth, okay? so. We, it's not that we say, well, I don't feel like getting reborn. Like one day, you know, we say, well, I don't feel like going to work to get, we stay home. Well, I don't feel like getting reborn and we don't. No, it's not like that, okay? We're going to get reborn because we're under the power of ignorance. We don't understand the nature of reality. So if we choose, if we don't want to get reborn, then we need to put a lot of effort into practicing the path that the Buddha taught because that path will teach us how to cease the causes of rebirth in this cycle of existence, of constantly recurring problems, okay? And, to, and the chief thing that will prevent rebirth is, is wisdom, Under, you know, generating the wisdom that understands that things lack all the fanciful ways of existence that we project on them, okay? If we meditate on that, we realize the you know, lack of inherent existence, we purify our mind of ignorance, anger, and clinging attachment. At that point, then we don't have to take rebirth. And in addition, if we spent our life cultivating love and compassion, then if we choose to be reborn, we don't experience any suffering because our rebirth is coming from a place of compassion. So the great bodhisattvas who appear in our world, they are manifesting, they are appearing, they are not reborn under the influence of ignorance, so they don't experience suffering like we do. Okay. Okay, so this person's saying, what about people who die in their sleep? Uh, there's no chance of, of thoughts. So I think they're referring to, you know, when I said what, what you're thinking about when you die influences the karma that you ripen. Well, before you went to sleep, you were thinking about something, okay? And this is actually why it's very important at the end of the day before we go to sleep to, to do some purification and to make sure that we go to sleep with a very peaceful mind so that uh, our sleep will, will sleep well and we'll have pleasant dreams and we'll wake up with a good thought in our mind. And then if we die in our sleep, some good karma will ripen, okay? But it's very important to, to try and do some, you know, purification in the evening and make peace with what happened during the day so that our heart and mind is peaceful when we sleep. Okay. And then they're saying, what about gurus who know their death and meditate throughout their death? 
Okay, there are some realized beings who uh, can meditate while they're dying. Uh, these people don't need to be recognized as gurus, and not all gurus have this ability. But there are some people who, uh, because of their excellent practice at the time they die, they just meditate right through it. Well, that's happening because of the power of their spiritual realizations. Okay, so these people have realized the nature of reality, they've realized emptiness, or maybe they've realized bodhicitta, and so when they die, then their minds are very smooth, very peaceful, okay? Uh, they can choose, if they're following the Mahayana path where their, their purpose is to benefit others, then they choose whether, where they're going to be reborn because they want to uh, be reborn with people that they have that connection with so that they can benefit them more. Okay, so do you speak of karma from your own ex uh, experience of good karma um, from being ordained? Well, I can say that being ordained has, brought, has really changed my mind and that you feel when you hold vows, after a while of feeling vows, you can feel this shift in your mind. It comes very, very gradually. And I think it comes because you have attention, intentionally refrained from harm, harmful actions, and you are intentionally trying to behave in kind ways. And through the power of keeping the vows, you know, you feel that you're being held up by some support of good karma. Yeah, there is that kind of shift in your mind because when we go through our life creating a lot of negative karma, then we tend to have a lot of guilt. We have a lot of remorse. There can be a lot of fear and a lot of worry. When we keep precepts, it really, we stop creating that kind of karma and we're purifying our mind in a much more intense way. So. It, you start feeling that support by the positive karma. Now, as lay people, you know, you can take the five lay precepts and keep them, and that acts as a support for you building up that good karma that changes your mind. For those of you who have the thought to, to ordain, I really encourage you to explore that because it's a wonderful life and it enables you to really purify your mind much more quickly and create a great deal of positive uh, potential. So I would certainly encourage you in that direction. And for the people who, who choose to remain as lay people, encourage you to take the five precepts and to practice as best as you can on a daily basis. Okay, so we know the importance uh, of being loyal to our loved ones. What happens if we repeatedly commit adultery? Well, you're not being loyal, are you? <laughs> How to keep it from happening? Um, <laughs> first of all, think of all the disadvantages. Okay. Because when you commit adultery, you are creating the cause to have a miserable marriage right now, okay, and you're creating the cause in future lives to have a lot of disharmony in your relationships. Okay. Anybody here like disharmonious relationships? Anybody here like relationships where you fight, where you don't trust each other, where you yell and scream at each other. Anybody like that? No, okay? Being, having sexual relationships outside of your committed relationship, or even if you're single, going with somebody who is in a relationship, it creates the karma for that kind of result. Okay, and you can see it right away because when you commit adultery, then your, your marriage becomes a mess. 
you know? And then what happens to your kids? Because kids know that mom or dad has been fooling around. You know, the kids know it. Okay, then how does it affect your kids? Yeah. How does it affect all the people around you? Yeah. How do you feel about yourself? You had a little bit of pleasure for what, a half an hour? Yeah, is it worth all the misery afterwards for that little bit of pleasure? So when you think of the disadvantages of adultery, yeah, uh, then you, th and the advantages of, you know, taking the time and energy to build a good marital relationship, then you try and keep the third precept and not have extramarital relationships. Can bad karma be neutralized? Um, is there really a way to neutralize it or do we have to pay it back? Yes, it can be purified, it can be neutralized. And in fact, the rest of this chapter, you know, if you go home and read this, he's gonna talk about how we neutralize, how we purify bad karma. Because all of us have created bad karma. Okay, so we, all of us need to do purification. Yeah. And in, in fact, it's very good to do purification in a re, you know, on a daily basis because then we don't stockpile a lot of guilt and a lot of remorse and a lot of uneasy feelings. Neutralizing our bad karma through doing purification is very psychologically helpful. Okay, because we don't feel weighed down and it alleviates our guilt. So we're gonna be getting into how to do that in the next three days. So you gotta come back for the next installment. <laughs> okay. Okay, can our merits be, I can't, Read the last word, it starts with an M. Maybe it's measured? Okay, can our merits be measured? Not in the same way that you weigh out how many kgs of apples you have, okay? And not in the way that you measure your bank account, okay? <laughs> um, so merit is, is not measured like that. Um, Merit is measured by the strength of our, in, of our intention. So, and this is one of the reasons why bodhicitta is very important. Because when we have that motivation to become enlightened for the benefit of all beings, okay, we have the highest, most noble intention there is because we're concerned with every single living being. So any positive action we do with that motivation creates oceans and skies of merit, okay? So it creates just incredible amount of merit because we're thinking of the benefit of all living beings and we're thinking of the highest benefit, their enlightenment, okay? So when we do even a small action like offering one single flower, or a small action, like being kind to the people that we live with. If we do that with a motivation of bodhicitta, we create incredible amount of merit, okay? So the strength of the merit depends to a large extent on our motivation. Okay, so why is there strong enmity between some people and a strong good connection between others? So is there such a thing as karmic connection between people? Yeah, there's karmic connection between people. And so uh, this is one reason why in our life we try and be as kind to everybody as we can because when we're kind, we're creating a good karmic connection with them, which means 
in the future, when we meet them, there will be an automatic bond. There will be some kind of trust. It'll also mean in the future that if we become bodhisattvas, we're going to be able to help these people because of the karmic connection. Okay? And this is one of the reasons why, for example, we make offerings to holy beings, is because that's our way of creating a karmic connection with them so that it opens the door for them to be able to benefit us and lead us to enlightenment. Okay? So, yeah, there is karmic connection. Sometimes, you know, we may have a very uneasy feeling about somebody right away. We haven't even talked to them. You know, I, I'm always a little suspicious of those feelings when that happens. I say, well, maybe there was some negative karma between us in the past, but whatever was in the past is finished. Right now, I want to create a good bond with that person, so let's treat them with kindness, and let's reform that whatever karma there was in the past. Okay, so this is a very good question. I've heard uh, many benefits of mantra recitation, but which is more important, to cultivate love and compassion and to train our mind, or just to do mantra recitation? Because I heard that mantra recitation is the shortcut to enlightenment. The purpose of mantra recitation is to generate love and compassion. Okay, so cultivating our mind to, to generate love and compassion and training our mind, that's the real Dharma practice. Okay, mantra recitation is said to help us do that. But just reciting mantra will not get you to enlightenment. Okay, because we have to train our mind. If reciting mantra alone got you to enlightenment, then all these little machines that chant Namo Amitofo would have already become Buddhas. Because <laughs> they chant much more mantra than we do. <laughs> okay? And you can chant mantra and be completely distracted. You know, you watch sometimes people, you know, Oh, I pay, oh, I pay. <laughs> Are you going to get enlightened chanting mantra like that? No. Okay? Even if you keep complete silence, but in your heart, you are practicing forgiveness to the people that you had enmity towards. Even you're not reciting one mantra, but in your heart, you are apologizing to people that you're, you've harmed. You know, you're forgiving people who have harmed you. That is real practice. And that creates incredible positive potential and incredible harmony in your life. But if you recite zillions of mantra, and as soon as you stop, go out and criticize other people, or get all arrogant, oh, I've recited so many mantra. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> you know? You can see if the people with an attitude like that, that's not getting you to enlightenment, no matter how many mantra you recite. So it's the real transformation of what's going on inside. Reciting mantra is helping us to transform what goes on inside. So reciting mantra is useful, but it has to be coupled with the actual meditations on love and compassion. Okay. When we recite O Mani Pemi Hung, we should be thinking kind thoughts about others. You shouldn't be reciting O Mani Pemi Hung and at the same time thinking of how to get revenge for somebody who hurt you. Okay? 
So when you recite Om Mani Padme Hum, think of Kuan Yin's qualities. Think of the qualities of, of Chenrezi, Avalokiteshvara. Try and generate those qualities. Okay, that will lead you to enlightenment. Okay, so. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the enlightened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May the born have no decline, but increase forevermore.